All right, I'll, I'll move forward with the uh, introductions of the Senate Bill 1420 committee members. We've got Peter Key representing Harris County Toll Road Authority. Matt Sebesta representing HGAC. He's Brazoria County Commissioner, Precinct 2. City of Houston, Jeff Weatherford. And then for the City of Pearland, Council Member Scott Sharman. I'll turn this over for comments to Russell from our Textile Administration. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Russell Zaplak, um, TxDOT's Chief Planning and Projects Officer. I'd like to, to welcome all of the committee members as well as the, the people in the audience um, to, for joining us today. This is an extremely important process for us and uh, a process that um, uh, has been developing over the, the last year or two um, as we move through and, and look at these big projects. Um, part of the, the, the committee itself has a very uh, specific task that uh, you're, you're being asked to accomplish um, um, at this meeting or future meetings if necessary. Uh, but one of the things that, that from Textile's perspective that we want to see and like to see um, is just getting the local stakeholders involved in these discussions. I think it's very important that the committee, um, if, if you have uh, thoughts, um, um, that we, we, we share those, we, we talk you through the project. Um, please keep in mind, the project is, at this point is relatively um, conceptual in nature. We don't have, we can't answer a lot of scope issues or such, but we'll try to the degree we can. Um, but uh, again, the, the main focus of this meeting is really talking about um, potential financing for the project. And I'll let um, Eddie and others uh, uh, take you through that and uh, walk you through the project. But again, I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time, taking part of your busy schedule to sit on this committee and, and provide us your valuable input. Uh, thank you, Russell. Uh, I want to start today by talking about the purpose of the meeting and kind of reiterate what uh, Russell's already said. There are three items that this committee is going to address. One is, uh, and, it, and it's really to get uh, a report put out. Uh, the, in the report, there are three items to discuss, and one is the allocation of financial risk for this project. Uh, the method of finance, that's the model, business model that we're going to use to deliver the project. And then the, uh, the tolling structure methodology for the project. And we hope that after today's meeting that you will see that we've addressed some of those and, be, and we'll, we're here to answer any questions that you may have. And then, of course, to discuss and, and uh, deliberate on the report and getting that report to our executive director, which I think uh, Rebecca is going to brief you more on. Uh, starting with the risk allocation. Uh, the risk allocation, if you look at uh, a traditional design bid build approach, starts with where the, uh, uh, the public sector uh, has the most risk. In this case, for a design bid build, uh, we're transferring risk to the contractor uh, and everything else is the, 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 the entity responsible for that project, uh, such as uh, uh, designing it, uh, operating, maintaining it, uh, financing, and that's, all of that belongs to the uh, public sector. So as you move forward with these different models that we're going to be talking about today, uh, you transfer some of those risks over to the developer. For example, the design bill, you transfer the design over to the developer. So the developer has both design build and uh, design and construction responsibilities, but the owner still maintains the operate, finance, and maintain elements of the project. The one that, the model that, the concession model, the CDA concession model is the one that we transfer the most risk to, and they have responsibility for all of those elements, all five elements. Uh, as this other slide kind of gives you a better idea of all the different elements we're, we're referring to and who has responsibility. So as we deliberate about these models, so we, you keep this in mind to understand the risk that we're transferring over to the private sector as, as we deliberate about the models that we're considering. So with that, I want to ask uh, Rebecca to talk about the reason why we're here. 
Hello. Um, I wanted to um, focus on the reason um, that we call this a 1420 committee, um, and that is this is a formal um, approval process that was put in place by the 82nd legislature, that's the one from two years ago, um, and put into the transportation code. Um, we also have some rules uh, that TxDOT has put in place to fill out what's in the, uh, the statute. The statute's less than a half page long, so it doesn't have a lot of detail. Um, so we do have both the rules and, um, and also some explanation on how we got to where we got to on the rules contained behind the last blue page in your briefing booklets. So if you have questions even after the meeting about um, what we're doing and, and what we're asking you to do, um, that's a good place to, to get a little more explanation of that. I wanted to focus, um, to start with a, a little bit again on, on the slides that, that Eddie presented to you um, because, let's see how you do the right. Um, because this committee, as I said, is kind of a formal uh, requirement of law, and it's a requirement when TxDOT has a tow project that it wants to deliver in a manner where private entities have financial risk in the project performance. Now, what that really means is, are we considering at least as one of the possibilities a concession agreement where um, a developer will, for up to about 52 years, have the primary financial risk of, of the project's performance. And if, if we are having that kind of transfer of risk to a private entity, then what the law says is that local stakeholders who are set by law um, will have an opportunity to determine certain matters that are fundamental to that transfer of risks. So that's where we get the, the three matters that are to be determined. And so all of you are here because you are, are representatives of governmental entities that are considered to have a stake in those decisions. So HGAC is the MPO, has a member, that's Mr. Sebesta. Hectra, as the local um, tow project entity, has um, a member. TxDOT has a member on the committee, and then any county or municipality that's uh, committed to make a contribution has a seat at the table also. So a part of what's on the agenda today that's also in the rules is that the committee, uh, in order to conduct its business, elect a chair and a vice chair. Um, and so going forward for today and, and then for any future meetings, um, the chair and the vice chair will be responsible for conducting um, the committee activities. Um, as Eddie mentioned, um, there are three matters that the committee is responsible for determining in the circumstances I just laid out. Um, allocation of financial risk, and you will see um, that we prepared a, a sample form of report um, that's also in your briefing materials on an allocation of financial risk between the public sector and, and the private sector. So again, if, if there were concessions selected, there would at least be a portion of the risk transferred to the private sector, and much of it, as a matter of fact. So the method of financing, uh, again, if it's private funds that are the major part, um, that's something that the committee must determine that um, it's prepared to have uh, the private sector take on most of the financial risk. The tolling structure and methodology are a matter for you to determine in this particular circumstance because there's not a regional toll policy that's binding on this project. So there's a draft tolling policy that's also in your materials uh, to consider, comment on, as, as you believe appropriate. Um, but that becomes the third matter for you to determine as a part of your, your functions on the committee. And then what you do once you're prepared to make those determinations is you do 
um, sign a report and then submit that to the executive director. Um, the rules require that report to be made for this project um, by the time uh, TxDOT is going to be issuing an RFQ. So that probably will be sometime in May, so we'll need to have the committee's work done before that time in order to stay on the current schedule for, um, for this project. Um, if the committee is unable to come to um, a conclusion for those three matters to be determined and doesn't file a report by that time, then what TxDOT is permitted to do to move forward with the project is rely on any business terms that HGAC has put in place for this kind of project. Um, but bearing those in mind, TxDOT is free to proceed to develop the project. As you can see, we've got people here recording the meeting. We've also filed a notice of the meeting eight days ahead of time um, under the open meetings law. Um, the agenda is usually kept fairly flexible. If there are future meetings after today, um, any member of the committee can suggest agenda items. You can put into agendas time for discussion on topics. So there's a fair amount of flexibility, but we do need to post the agenda, whatever it turns out to be, eight days before the meeting. And then to conduct further meetings. We have a quorum today, but a quorum is one half or more of the members appointed to the committee, and then the decisions, including those determinations, are made by majority vote of the members who are present at the meeting. TxDOT's role going forward, other than having a member of the committee, is to support the committee. So. We'll file those meeting notices for you and provide whatever administrative support that you need through our strategic, strategic projects office here in uh, Houston, um, headed by uh, Eddie Sanchez. Once that report is made by the committee then and filed with the executive director, then the committee's work is done unless there is some other kind of uh, change in the project that would require the committee to come back and reconvene and then the same kind of uh, actions would happen again um, to take care of that change. And I'm happy to answer any questions or we can proceed on with the, the project overview. But we'll proceed. Um, just for, for the record, you know, I just want to uh, make sure everybody knew that this meeting is being recorded for, uh, for recording purposes, so I just want to make sure you, you realize that. Uh, in order to get into the project overview, I'm just going to go over the general scope of the project. I'm not going to go into details of the project, but in order to do that, I'm gonna, uh, I just wanted to give you uh, some, some history as to how we got here. Uh, for example, the reason, a lot of the main reasons we're here is because we were able to come to an agreement between the state of Texas and Harris County uh, on a memorandum of understanding to develop and, and, and to, uh, pursue the development of the portion in Harris County. And through that agreement, we made commitments to other projects, four other projects. Uh, wanted to make sure that uh, before we got there that everybody knew that as of today, we have TxDOT has the has primacy in the portion in Harris County, and the Brazoria Brazoria County has the portion has responsibility for the portion in in Brazoria County. The other commitments that we made in the MOU indicate, uh, are are the improvements to to Almeda Road FM 521, is the widening facility from two lanes to four lanes, and the purpose of all these four uh, projects is to provide better flow from traffic from the south going north and north going south uh, without having to travel in a toll lane. So we was, that was the, 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 just, uh, the, the reason behind it. Uh, and that project, the Alameda FM 521, has uh, identified funds uh, already and it's uh, uh, 
uh, and it's part of the two billion dollars that Techstop made available to the to the state of Texas and part of it in the Houston area. Uh, FM uh, 865 Cullen Boulevard, is, again, is another project around Bellway 8 that we converted from a two-lane to a four-lane, again, to facilitate flow from the south to the north. Uh, part of it is under construction, the, the part south of Bellway 8 is under construction and began the, the portion north of Bellway 8 in 2014. Again, that project has uh, identified funds uh, for the project. On the next page, we have the, the, the Cambridge extension on this, this project and the next one, the Texas Medical Center, is to provide better connectivity into the medical center. So we, we're proposing a project at the uh, Cambridge and at 610 Interchange. Uh, that project is to begin construction in 2014 as of today. Funding has been identified as part of the $2 billion uh, funding source and uh, uh, we're in the process of planning that project. Uh, the Texas Medical Center Connector is also a project that's it's ongoing through the environmental process. Um, uh, we have alternative analysis being performed as we speak. Uh, funding commitment has been identified, and that's also part of the $2 billion that uh, TxDOT made available to these projects. Let me begin in talking about the, 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 the project, that uh, the ultimate project. In order to talk about 288, you have to start with the ultimate project because that's what the environmental document is uh, approving. It's uh, from US 59 in, uh, uh, in Harris County down to County Road 60, which is a future interchange of the Grand Parkway. It's 25.2 miles long at a cost of, of around $1.3 billion. Uh, we're proposing uh, four toll lanes in the middle, uh, the reconstruction of the 610 interchange, eight direct connectors at the Beltway 8 interchange, and some additional general purpose lanes in between 610 and Beltway 8. As of right now, there are no funds available for this project. The next slide kind of shows you a pictorial representation of the project, starting from top to bottom. The, the top uh, typical shows what the existing condition is today. The middle one is to show what this initial project that we're going to be implementing, uh, what it will look like, and you see that the we're, we're basically constructing four lanes in the median, existing median. Uh, there's room for that. And then on the bottom one is the ultimate, whenever we get to that point in the future that we need to add general, additional general purpose lanes, we'll add them on the general purpose lanes on the outside. That's a, a current plan. And then talking about the initial project, that's the project we're talking about funding now uh, with this uh, uh, RFQ, RFP process, this procurement process, and that's a project that, that uh, begins at uh, US 59 in uh, Harris County and goes down to County Road 58 in Brazoria County. Uh, the portion, again, the blue, as you see, the, the drawing is, is the portion in Harris County, and the red portion is in uh, Brazoria County. The, the Harris County portion is 10.4 miles long, uh, with some connectivity to the interchange at, uh, at 610. We build all eight connectors, uh, direct connectors at Beltway 8, and we're building all four uh, toll lanes in the middle. Uh, the Brazoria County, uh, as, as the plan is the four uh, toll lanes in the middle, uh, a T ramp, and so wishbones at, at 518 and the Hughes Ranch Road, and that project is 4.9 miles long. Uh, that's the summary of the project project scope, uh, and I'm going to ask Mr. Munoz to talk about the financing. Thank you. I'm, I'm John Munoz. I'm the Deputy Director of Innovative Finance for TxDOT. On slide 22, uh, we just give you a basic overview of the costs of the project. The development costs are about uh, $567 million. Uh, the the um, operations and maintenance costs are around $650 million, and life cycle costs are $922 million approximately. For a total of $2.1 billion uh, in the design, build, and concession uh, toll scenarios. Uh, this does have a 52-year uh, accumulation of costs reflected um, under both models. Uh, routine maintenance and life cycle costs are right away to right away, um, including the general purpose lanes and the frontage roads. On the next slide, thank you, Eddie. We have the estimated subsidy amount uh, for each of the delivery models. 
there are public funds, as Eddie has mentioned, uh, committed to the Medical Center Connector Project, the 18.1 million that Eddie referred to earlier. Uh, there are no additional public funds available to the project. The concession uh, model produces an upfront concession fee, uh, and that is indicative of the risk that the, tip, the private sector typically is willing to take. And so those assumptions are reflected in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the model that we've developed. The design build option requires a subsidy uh, because of the conservative nature relative to the uh, private sector's approach uh, that uh, a typical muni financed uh, bond, bond funded toll facility uh, is delivered under. Under the concession model, all routine maintenance and life cycle costs are paid by the developer. Uh, uh, the estimated concession fee is uh, 75 million. Uh, and under the design build methodology, estimated, estimated to be 377 million of subsidy, uh, and that would be prior to an O&M subsidy that's required during the early years of the project, uh, kind of kind of through the ramp up period. On the next slide, we were just trying to give you some kind of a sense of what the uh, method of the financing assumptions were under each of the delivery models. Uh, we have assumed a tax exempt bond issuance uh, supported by toll revenues with a, a 175 coverage on there uh, on the on the on the revenues, uh, in or, in indicating what the uh, risk associated with. The unpredictability of revenues and trying to create some um, reasonable security that we would have the revenues sufficient for debt service and operations and maintenance as well as public funds uh, would be needed to make up that shortfall. Uh, there's right-of-way to right-of-way uh, maintenance and the operating subsidy is 20 million during the first two years of the uh, opening of the facility. And so we just show you the cash flows and kind of the, the uh, prioritization and the emphasis on debt service and, and uh, maintenance and where those dollars are going and the potential excess revenues on the project. On, slide, on the next slide, uh, the concession approach has a, has a, a, a slug of equity uh, in the project and between the debt that the, that the equity uh, investors can uh, generate and their willingness to take risk, uh, they are uh, pretty effective at, at raising the debt needed and can probably get up to about a 70-30% equity to, to debt ratio. Uh, the debt component is uh, tax-exempt private activity bonds uh, with minimum coverage of a 1.5 times coverage and there is a, 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 a contingency risk of 13.5%. You see the cash flows and how they compare. John, yes. What does risk contingency at 13.5 percent mean? Uh, that that is uh, the expected uh, excess revenues, kind of consistent with the potential excess revenues. If if they if those revenue levels are actually achieved, they the uh, pink area would be representing the 13.5 percent rate of return yeah. on the project. The, the, uh, you, you, the, you've got a little visual depiction of the debt service and the maintenance dollars and the taxes and then the excess revenues after that. On the, oh, so uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions you have at this time or we can hold them for later. Thank you. Before we move on, does anybody have any questions before we move on? No, Peter asked a question I had. Okay. Was that answered sufficiently? Yes, sir. But for me, it was. Uh, I think I still got some learning to do, but I'll, uh, I'll, I, I think for now, it's a good enough answer. All right, just to move forward, we need to select a chair and a vice chair. Um, then possibly schedule our next meeting, if needed. Then we'll have approval of the meeting minutes and then adjourn. But we got other business to, to attend to and let, I'm gonna let Russell just uh, make some other comments before we go with the selection of chair and vice chair. 
Well, actually, Mike, why don't you all do your selection? But then I think the intent is that the um, um, committee would, you know, we would get into discussion on um, the particulars in the presentation. Um, if there are any more questions, uh, we certainly would want to um, um, visit with you and, and have a good open discussion on the process. Um, there, you know, again, we're, we're looking at um, um, the allocation of risk, the methods of financing, and the tolling structure. As I think Eddie indicated, there the tolling structure is back here. I think we, we do need to have that discussion today as well. Um, so uh, I don't, uh, I can't, I'm not going to let you guys get out of here that quickly. So uh, if you would, uh, please uh, um, proceed forward with the election of your um, officers. There be any nominations for chair? I'll make a motion to nominate Mike Alford being the chair. The project currently resides with TxDOT responsibility. I'll second that. Would the um, committee uh, like to take a vote on Mike as the chair? Vote on. Aye. 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 Okay, Mike. Uh, then officially, you now have the gavel. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Don't turn your bench up too long. Yeah. Nomination for vice chair. I nominate Commissioner Sebesta. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. We've got a vice chair. <laughs> All right. Good. Uh, any further discussions on the allocation of risk? Uh, we went through that very quickly, but um, um, is everybody pretty much understand? There, there's two methods out there that we're looking at: design build, as well as a concession contract. Um, the the design build analysis. Um, obviously is, is primarily just what it says design and construction only with with um, the um, tech stop then would or the public sector would then take the risk for the rest of the project be it um, operations maintenance and um, um, revenue risk uh, on the other side of the equation the um, concession project would obviously all that risk or the majority of that risk would be transferred to a, a private entity. Um, questions, gentlemen? I think our question is probably about the same. When I look at page 22, if I understand, or sheet 22, as I understand this correctly, that with the concession type of thing, the concession option, basically $75 million comes in as revenue, basically, the concessionaire will pay $75 million approximately to TxDOT. If we go with the design build, then TxDOT has to pay $377 million to get this project off the ground and going. And as I also understood, that there's not really funding set aside for this project. So if we were to go with the design build, option, then the money, that $377 million it would cost to build this product does not currently exist. Is that correct? That is correct. I think uh, we would, um, uh, we, the state does not have that money available, so if the project was to move forward, it would require um, looking to um, our local stakeholders to um, support that. That last time I checked. Peter's one with the money. Uh, <laughs> Russell, the $75 million concession fee, that would be payable to TxDOT? Uh, first off, let me, let me clarify a little bit on the $75 million. Um, basically, as we move forward and refine the scope and um, um, the actual financing, actually what interest rates do over the next 6 to 12 months when we put this deal together is going to have a lot of impact on what that would be. 
um, and in looking at it that could be somewhere down in 10 million dollar range up to 75 million dollar range again depending upon all the various factors that will go into it um, that that those funds would come in and um, the um, TxDOT would um, use those funds on the corridor or they would stay in the region um, it's been our policy so uh, um, depending upon what that number ultimately is we could take that money and use it for perhaps improvements on 610 a uh, portion of that money could go back to the MPO for use on other area projects um, a portion of that money could uh, um, be used uh, to make other improvements uh, but again on the you know ultimately I think we want to try to reach down to um, um, the future Grand Parkway which I don't think this project gets us there yet so even combined with Missouri County's proposed project so. so it's envisioned today that that theoretical concession fee would be used within the corridor at a minimum used within the region yes sir it is okay, thank you As far as the method of financing goes, John ran that uh, ran through that fairly quickly. Again, um, uh, the one thing I'd like to stress, and John can, can correct me here as appropriate, but when we do a public financing, which we would do on a design build project, um, just because we're putting public funds at risk, we're putting. Um, we, we have to take a much more conservative approach, and that's why you see the delta of the, the $377 million. Um, we will, um, um, the, the concession approach, on the other hand, is able to, to use a much more aggressive approach. And basically, their margin, if you would, becomes their, the risk contingency that, that Peter asked about a, a little bit earlier. Um, if if uh, they can be more aggressive, if if they meet their numbers, then they basically get that in, back in the the form of um, a margin or a rate of return. If they don't meet their numbers, then they still basically cover their costs. So, um, but again, it's um, in this process, it's a private sector risk. It's their ability to do that. The reason they can do that is, quite frankly, they have the ability to put equity into the deal they're um, typically putting what 25 50 percent what are they yeah, it's, the, uh, it's the assumption for here is 30 uh, percent it can go 35 65 we've also seen that so so it's like a down payment on on your house when you're doing a mortgage um, when with us doing it from the public sector we're to the point of um, we're putting zero down so our terms aren't quite as good whereas they're able to put down um, uh, 30 35 percent of the the value so therefore they get a little more flexible terms from the bank um, from that perspective and they're able to uh, be more aggressive in how they finance the project so. any any other questions on the um, method of financing Um, the toll structure, Eddie, it's in the package. It's in the package. On the next set of uh, blue sheets, we have a, a a draft report for your consideration, and uh, the tolling the tolling structure is there for uh, your consideration. I've I've got one question on the tolling policy down at the fourth bullet where it says both parties will meet and mutually agree upon maximum toll rates for the corridor based on operational financial requirements considerations. I think we need to define both parties. It's a little bit nebulous right now. I, th I think we know what the intent of that might be, but I think we need to define both who both parties might be in that. I think the intent is that that would be Bazoria County and TxDOT. The, um, TxDOT is the... Um, operator of the um, 
um, Harris County portion, Brazoria County as the operator, Brazoria County um, Toll Authority um, as the operator of the um, Brazoria County piece. Could we add behind parties, parentheses, text dot, and Brazoria County? Thank you. And I think it's worth noting that this tolling policy is intended to be a, a corridor, you know, a 288 corridor tolling policy with some flexibility within it for the, the two projects within that. But it, but it is intended to be a, right. a corridor tolling policy. Can we uh, make that, that note on here that it's specifically for the 288 projects? the initial projects in both Harris and Missouri County. Mr. Those, Mr. Uh, Chairman, can I ask you a question? Yes. On the tolling policy, the um, the bullet uh, says that time of day pricing will be used. Um, I just wanted to inquire whether or not the Texas Transportation Commission had already adopted a policy that further defines the mechanisms in which you would apply time of day pricing. Is that known? No, it, it, it varies by region and project. There's flexibility in that. The commission has not set a standard by which all projects must operate under. So then my, I guess my question would be, uh, based on the previous bullets, would that would you anticipate that to be negotiated with Brazori County and TxDOT as the two primary partners? Yes. Thank you. I got a question. That the, the 45 miles per hour, is that, is that pretty, uh, pretty customary number on toll roads? Uh, in the um, Dallas-Fort Worth area, the region is using 50 miles an hour. Um, the, the feds, uh, FHWA, has recommended, I believe, 45 miles an hour. Um, it's it's um, a local preference. Uh, 45 miles an hour will allow more vehicles in, but 50 miles an hour will keep throughput higher, I believe. Is that correct, Katie? So um, it, it's by setting it at 45, um, we we have a little bit of flexibility in how we operate it. Mr. King, what are we using in your facilities overall? Level service C on I-10, I think it was previously defined by the feds, is roughly 50 miles per hour. Granted, uh, I-10 and what is envisioned for 288 will be different facilities because of the HOV component. On I-10, this will be more of a pure toll road. Uh, under the policies, under that last bullet point, it may need to be added uh, with regards to exemptions for certain vehicles as applicable with state law, uh, that there are uh, certain rules defining who has free rights to existing toll roads in the state. So that would read, Peter, exemptions for active emergency vehicles and veterans as applicable to state law? Yeah, I, I defer to Rebecca because okay. it's really a legal legal issue as to who can go on toll roads free of charge. Right, and there are two approaches to that here. There, the two approaches are you can have a policy um, that goes beyond what's required under state law if it's permitted under state law. Or you can say, if it's required under state law, that's that's what we'll do. There's also some benefit to having some consistency with what's done elsewhere in the region as well, such as what Hector is doing. We would strongly What, what's in here right now, the exemptions for active emergency vehicles and, and veterans, that's not required by state law, but there, there is legislation that would require both of these under state laws. The veterans policy is permissive rather than required so far, but that may change soon, so that's why we went ahead 
and included exemptions for active emergency vehicles and veterans. Um, if you want to say as applicable under state law, you still have some flexibility there going forward to uh, massage that a little bit. So would this, would this could read exemptions um, would be made as applicable for state law? Is applicable under state law, so, right? So, would the, would the committee um, support that change? Okay. Okay. So, Mike, I guess I'd ask if with those three changes to the um, um, toll, the proposed toll policy, um, adding. Um, this is primarily for the 288 corridor, um, the two initial projects um, that uh, both parties in parentheses, Texas and Missouri County, close parentheses, and exemptions um, will be as applicable for um, uh, by state law. Um, with those three changes, would the committee? Um, approve or is, is is that this policy um, acceptable to the committee? Committee members? Just ask one question just as a comparison sake. How do these initial numbers is 35 cent and the six cent a mile compared to other toll roads throughout the region and throughout the state? I mean are those are those how do we compare I mean are we consistent with what has been set? For other roadways, or are they high, or are they low? Katie, would you? They're actually in, they're they're very comp comparable to um, the Harris County toll road rates, and we looked at their rates and and averaged them out, and they're also comparable to the toll rates here in Texas. I, I think I'll help our my fellow committee members by getting some data as to what's being used on facilities such as this, particularly in the state, but maybe even elsewhere, where this really isn't just a regular cut and dry toll road as we tend to have in the region. It's gonna be based on time of day pricing. That price is gonna be demand driven. Let's see what other facilities similar to this are charging today. Um, would you guys, you want to come back and look at this again, Peter? Is that your, your thought? I or think are you good. uncomfortable with the, these are the minimum charges? The minimum. Oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, don't characterize it as uncomfortable, Russell, but, uh -huh. um, you know, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you what the minimum rates are for facilities being built in Dallas, what minimum rates are being charged on some of the hot lane projects around the country. But I can get access to that data and help help the committee feel comfortable with with what's on the printed page. And just from my perspective, I would, I would appreciate seeing those numbers. My folks are going to be the ones who are primarily going to be using this roadway in and out uh, of, of Pearland. And I just want to make sure that uh, when I go back to them, that I can tell them we presented something uh, that's fair to them and it's comparable to what folks around the region are, are being charged uh, to drive on the roadway. Go ahead, yeah. no. Let's say, Scott, your your concern is within the region, not so much with Dallas or Austin or anything like that. It's mostly within. It's within the region, but I mean, if I don't know how hard it would be to pull statewide numbers, I, I just want a fair comparison. I mean, if we're if we're going to be putting this out there, um, you know, your folks are going to be as affected as mine. So, mm -hmm. um, just just a, it's it's not as I'm not looking at the numbers and saying, well, wow, those are out of line. I honestly, I don't, I don't know, and I just would like for comparisons uh, purposes to see those numbers. But, but just as um, Katie has mentioned earlier, we did a research before we put them down, and we are looking at the Harris County Toll Road system, and these are numbers that are very comparable to their system. So I, mean, I, that homework. I appreciate that. The Harris County Toll Road guy is also saying he'd like to see the numbers. For clarity, <laughs> the, um, the county's toll road system. Let's take I-10 
off the table for a minute. There's one rate if you have an easy tag. It's not time of day or pricing applied to West Park or the Sam Houston Tollway. It's just I-10 where you've got more of a hybrid approach out there. And there's an HOV component, something different than what's envisioned for State Highway 288. So I tell my fellow committee members I'm going to do some homework, get our council member a little more comfortable with where we are. Yep. Mr. Chair, um, I don't even know that we need to include it in the toll and the tolling policy. But one of the things that we brought up earlier, as far as the concession fee, you mentioned that the fees would stay primarily in the corridor, possibly as far as the region. I do think that it's important. I think that when we get done with this project, we're going to have a lot of other smaller projects and stuff along this corridor that are going to be necessary to help facilitate and make this big. And I do think it's important that we remember that. I, I don't know that we need to basically put it down in stone here, but it's just something that I do think is important. I just had a thought uh, with regards to these minimum tolls per gantry and per per mile. In order to preserve the flexibility that that's needed, and because Brazoria and Text Brazoria County and Textot are already going to meet to mutually agree on maximum toll rates, why don't we just work together and come to something reasonable on the minimum as well for this corridor? Just an idea, and we could just take the, these two first bullets out. Just, I'm sorry. Isn't that kind of the responsibility of this committee? Isn't that one of the items that we're supposed to make a decision on? I mean, that's just kind of passed the, the buck to text on Missouri no, County, which... No, the, the regional tolling policy is something that's required for uh, 1420 action. But exactly what all the ingredients are, that there's flexibility. And we've already introduced the, 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 the mutually agreed concept. And so, and you are the primarily impacted uh, area. Brazoria County and, and uh, TxDOT will be responsible and accountable to the local citizenry. So uh, I think maybe it just makes sense to defer that. The maximum is the more sensitive of the two, and so this is the lesser of the two that you're going to talk about later. Sure. And I think as, as Peter um, can probably attest that uh, uh, showing a, a six cents a mile charge as a minimum is... I believe most of the toll roads um, in the state are, and I, I'm not going to speak for Peter's toll roads, but the ones in North Texas and the ones um, um, on the TxDOT system are running somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 cents a mile, plus or minus. Correct, correct. Yeah. So, is, is that what they were running from day one? Uh, Twelve and a half cents per mile was uh, the earlier round, of the original first round of toll facilities in 2002, 2005, 2007. That, those were the rates we were looking at per mile. And then they were escalated up from there. In the Austin, in the Austin and Dallas-Fort Worth areas. But they're, they're not the same facility, to Peter's point. And that's why it may be, ta it, in all fairness, it might just make, we want to make sure we make good decisions. And so it might take a little input from Hectra and a little more thought to come up with something reasonable for the minimum. But it's the type of tollway. Yeah. It's, it's, it kind of makes a distinction here. Yes, that the county's toll rates on the remainder of the system, absent I-10, are similar to what's in Dallas, 18 to 20 cents a mile. But here on a demand-driven facility where mm -hmm. tolls fluctuate by by traffic demand, particularly by time of day, as, as right. stated in this document, you tend to have low and high toll rates. I, I, I'd be, personally, I'd be very interested what the traffic and revenue consultants thought of a, of that, of a level of minimum toll rate and get their input into that discussion as well. It just, we need to know what the facility would look like in that scenario, Brazoria and TxDOT, because we, we don't need to be in a position where we're 
affecting congestion or uh, you know uh, uh, not meeting the objectives of the of the time of day pricing in the first place. So just something to think about. Any other questions? I've got a question for Peter. Peter, what is right now on the Beltway, Hardy, uh, West Park, what are what are your minimums that you're charging right now? Well, in terms of toll per mile, Harris County does not have a toll rate per mile. But if you, you know, go crunch the numbers, and again, you're, you ask specifically taking I-10 out of that equation, somewhere between 18 and maybe 22 cents, Commissioner. Uh, West Park may be a little higher than the Sam Houston tollway. And I think, you know, if you're familiar with the system, you don't have uniform distances between those tolling points. I pay a lot of money into the system. Sure. I utilize it quite often. Sure. <laughs> so. uh, I'd ask the committee to take a look at the committee report. We've drafted it up. Uh, and if you uh, would take the time to look through it, is there anything in the committee report that um, you you feel should be addressed that isn't um, um, something in that report that um, um, you feel we have not addressed adequately um, this again is a draft report that we'd be looking for you to ultimately approve so um, um, as you look through this if there's there's uh, you have thoughts you want to see changes different uh, different items discussed or additional items discussed we, we'd like to to understand that at this time if we could mr. chair would it uh, be possible for us to take a little bit of, of a break? I know we all have our different consultants and those type of folks that are that are here in attendance that would maybe give us a few minutes to confab with, with our folks and, and staff to kind of take a look at this uh, draft copy. Could we take maybe a 15 minute break? Sounds good to me. Let's uh, be back at 20 till three. Okay. Thank you. Let's go ahead and reconvene the meeting. During this uh, longer break, we were able to pull up some data on, on tolling cost, and so I'll ask Katie Nice to to go over some of this information. Sure. Actually, what I'm going to do is turn it over to our traffic and revenue consultant, Jacobs Engineering, Phil Eshelman. Um, but just to start off, there are about 12 Vantage Lanes hot lanes that are in the active operational in the country today. One of them is here in Texas, I-10. And then the rest are throughout the United States. And I'm going to have Phil walk through um, kind of why the pricing is a little bit challenging to tell you that there's one pricing. Um, because there are low pricing, low, low, what we call low ceilings, high ceilings, and then we have typical, and that's what you normally see. So they, and they fall within those pricing elements. But I'll let Phil kind of walk through his spreadsheet, and then he'll talk about some of the average cost per mile once he walks you through the sp spreadsheet and what each one means. So Phil? <coughs> okay, thank you, Katie. Um, so what we have here are the uh, managed lane facilities or congestion price facilities throughout the United States. Um, first column of the facilities with SR91 being uh, over in California, the first one. 
then we have the, we have the location, uh, the operator of those facilities, and then we talk about the typical uh, range of toll rates that we see on those facilities, uh, the, lot, the low toll and the high toll. Um, now this is for the full length trip. Um, what's probably more um, important for this conversation is the per mile rate. Um, again, as Katie was saying, the typical, uh, typically what we see um, being charged in these corridors to manage, and these are all managing traffic to a certain level of service or a speed um, between 50 and 45 miles per hour, typically. Uh, so for SR91, we see a, and we'll focus again on the per mile rate, somewhere between 14 cents and 96 cents per mile. Now SR91 is a fixed toll schedule. Some of these are dynamically priced, but this is fixed toll. So every three months they uh, republish toll rates depending on congestion in the corridor. Uh, for many months it doesn't change, but if they see some congestion in the corridor, they'll, uh, they'll uh, adjust the toll rates to, so that they can manage traffic. So what we see here, this 14 and this 96 cents are actual rates that they're charging. Uh, sometimes when we see typical and possible, those will change because it'll be in a dynamically priced environment where what we normally see is what we'll say is typical and then there's possible higher and lower tolls, or higher tolls I should say. So for SR91, we see 14 cents per mile and 96 cents per mile is the range. Um, going down I-15 express lanes, and, and these are all different facilities. Some have HOV components, some don't. Um, but it's just to give an uh, understanding of those ranges. Uh, I-15 just down, uh, just south of there, is a four cent per mile rate up to a 33 cent per mile rate. So we can see three cents and 40 cents for Minneapolis. Um, and as we go down, we see this minimum toll being, you know, around, well, 14 cents is the highest uh, for, for SR91. And then we see between three and four and eight cents um, per mile for the remainder of the facilities. And the high toll, of course, it, it, I should say the low toll is, is on these off-peak times when uh, your limited access free facility next to it is flowing freely. So uh, there's a lower incentive to get in those lengths, so we lower the tolls as low as possible while maintaining some sort of net positive toll revenue uh, versus the collection costs. And if we go from typical to possible, uh, is again, for SR91, we see the same numbers because they have a fixed toll schedule that's published every three months. Uh, for some of these facilities, we see, um, like for I-15, for instance, a dynamically priced facility, we see that 33 cents high toll per mile is what we typically see. It's possible to go all the way up to 67 cents per mile. Uh, same thing for the 394 express lanes. And the purpose of this is to give some comfort to those, those ranges that we provided in the toll policy. So Phil, can you go to the bottom and show the I-10, the numbers on I-10, and just kind of walk through those? Okay, let me see if I can freeze this. here in, uh, in Houston, we see the range of tolls between eight cents per mile and 33 cents per mile. Um, yeah, so eight cents and 33 cents, similar to what we've seen in the toll policy we provided. And Phil and Katie, for the record, I think since y'all developed this chart, the high toll went up by a dollar for a full trip during the peak period. Okay. It's now five dollars for a full trip under peak conditions. Thank you, Peter. So that thirty-three cents is slightly higher now. Yes. Yeah, and, and again, like the the, the Katy Freeway Managed Lanes is a different facility for sure from the two eighty-eight uh, corridor, uh, the HOV component um, that Katy offers, and. Uh, yeah, and obviously just a different corridor as well. Thank you, Phil.
Scott? Yeah, I, I appreciate pulling that data together during the break. Um, it is helpful to see everything in context, and um, I just wanted to kind of get a sense of if the numbers were consistent with what else is being done, and I'm okay with that. Thank you. Okay. I would, Mike, I would ask um, if the committee is comfortable, um, um, if uh, the committee is willing to accept the recommendations in the report today. Um, uh, we would ask uh, the committee members um, to um, review that, express their thoughts, and um, if appropriate, accept the report. And I think we have some forms that can be signed uh, if y'all are ready to do that. Committee members, y'all y'all ready to accept the report? Russell, did y'all get the all of the changes into the tolling policy? Uh, the, those three recommended we changes. On this, yeah, we're going to put it up on the screen so you can see what's. Uh, uh, great. Thank you. First page shows corridor tolling policy. The second change is the text out Missouri County in parentheses there. Highlighted. And then the third change exemptions as applicable under state law. <laughs> Did you uh, show that? Did you show that it was just for 288? That's the first page. Of the okay. I'm sorry. Can we mark that though? For it's it's the initial projects as opposed to unless Matt, do you um, would the, does the committee want to see this for all the 288 or just the the two initial projects? I guess I would. I think right now we're talking about just the initial. Right. So, um, <coughs> okay. Is that better? Yes. Is the committee comfortable with the, the changes? If so, can we get those printed out? Mike, I think we have copies of the um, recommendation letter um, that uh, if the members are um, willing to endorse. That would be um, I think the appropriate time to do so. Everybody willing to sign? All, all in favor on, I guess. Mike, I'd like to make one statement for the record that if TxDOT does develop the portion of this project within Harris County under the Comprehensive Development Agreement format, and if there are public funds, public subsidy, public grants, TIFI loans, et cetera, public money involved in the project, the public just ought to know. And I think TxDOT has shown that they've been willing to be fully transparent when it comes to public subsidies, but it ought to be out there. Thank you. There's there's a requirement under state law to, to make a to do a public hearing prior to entering into a comprehensive development agreement, and we would be following that law. Thank you. We need a vote on this, I guess. Uh, it probably would be better, or I think you could probably just sign whichever. Um, the, the determinations are by majority of members okay. present, so that suggests a vote. Okay. Guess not. Harris County votes aye. We vote aye. Hi. Aye. HGAC votes aye. Next time votes aye. Okay, we'll, if the members will um, stick around after the meeting, uh, we'll uh, get signatures on the appropriate pages and be sure everybody gets a copy for their records. And um, with that, Mike, I think uh, unless there's other business the committee would like to discuss or address, you're free to re adjourn. All right, meeting adjourned. Alan, you cancel that next meeting day. So thank, thanks for your hospitality and thanks everybody for attending, especially the committee members. Thank you.